Hi everyone, and today we will talk a little about security. Security is a very broad topic, so we will have just a, a glimpse of it, uh, and uh, hopefully that will entice you into learning more about it on your own. Do you see my screen? Yep. Okay. So. Uh, computer security is a broad topic. Uh, there are aspects that relate to every one of us as a user. There are aspects that relate to every one of us who is or wants to become or, or will become a software developer. And there's aspects that relate to products that, that we buy or that we build. Um, and so knowledge and culture around computer security should be pervasive and we all need to do our part. There are companies that are, you know, not doing what they should in terms of protecting the data and the computer assets that they have, and that's bad. There's also users that are not doing what they are supposed to do and, you know, hackers and, you know, evil malicious users can take advantage of one user who is not doing what they're supposed to be doing to protect their security and the security of others, and they can gain access to computer systems that they're not supposed to have access to. So we all need to collaborate, developers, companies, users, we all need to know what we're doing, we all need to do the right things, okay? So no one here, no one on this call, whatever our role is, is exempted from having a responsibility when it comes to computer security and data security. More generally, cybersecurity. That makes sense? Yes. I will take that yep. as a yes. These are announcements for the actual CS101 class. So why do we care about security? I will agree and disagree with some of the points that are on these slides. And I will point out which ones I agree with and which ones I don't agree with. Technology is not 100% safe. That's a fact of life, right? There's always some piece of software out there that is subject that is subject to a potential breach. Um, if you dig long and hard enough, pretty much any piece of software is subject to some kind of vulnerability, even the ones that are, you know, very, very carefully designed. There's always something that hasn't been thought of. So that's definitely something that I agree with. I'm not sure that that's one of the reasons that, that I care, or at least even if technology were 100% safe, it would only be 100% safe if every user was also um, doing all that they're supposed to be doing to stay safe. So we should care regardless of whether technology is 100% safe, okay? But on all the more because it's not. Uh, lots of people have had their identity stolen. Lots of people have had lots of money stolen. Um, lots of people have been subjected to, you know, uh, impersonation online. People have taken control of somebody else's uh, Facebook account, somebody else's Google account, and have performed actions using the identity that, that they stole, causing grief to the person whose identity was stolen. My social security number was stolen at least three times. And I can't count how many times it has been stolen that have not been reported. I will mention a couple of companies through which, actually three companies through which my social security number has been stolen. And chances are, uh, you know, if, if any of you uh, has either had a job in this country or, um, or is a dependent, of somebody who has had a job in this country, your social security number is probably out of the wild as well. Uh, the first one is Anthem Blue Cross, very large insurance company, very active here in California. Um, I would say about five years ago, they announced that pretty much their entire database had been stolen with many millions of, uh, of social security numbers. So that's one way that it was stolen to me. I had been, I was not at the time, but I had been insured with Anthem Blue Cross and my social security number was still in their system and it got stolen. Um, Paychecks, a company that pays people on behalf of companies. 
you know, it's one of the three major payroll vendors in the US. Lots of companies use paychecks. Paychecks got breached, I want to say about four years ago, or at least they reported it four years ago. They may have been breached 10 years ago, and for six years they didn't notice. But about four years ago, they reported this, and uh, they told everybody in their database uh, that their social security number had been stolen, and that they thought that the hackers who stole that data were going to use it to file fake tax, re uh, tax returns to ask for tax refunds from the government and then let the government, uh, let the IRS essentially sue the person with whose identity the, the tax return had been filed. Um, and the third time around uh, was with, oh gosh, one of the three credit reporting agencies um equifax maybe equifax thank you yeah. I, was, I was thinking Experian. equifax yeah so my social security number is now for all intents and purposes public domain right and we should all assume that our social security number is public domain so protect your social security number but assume assume that it's already been stolen by somebody somewhere um so why why do we care whether people steal our social security number? Like I said, they. I'm sorry, I have to dis, uh, disable my uh, earphone. You're speaking on mute. <laughs> yeah, he knows. He's trying to fix it. He knows. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you. I actually did not know that I was on mute because I was looking at another page. So thank you for letting me know. So why do we care that uh, our social security number or other personal information was stolen? Well, impersonation, big problem, right? Somebody sending a tax return to the IRS in my name, that could cause a tremendous amount of grief. Uh, people getting access to very private information with which they could cause all sorts of types of harm. For instance, if somebody knows that we have some health condition, for instance, by stealing information from a health insurance company like Anthem, um, they could use that information to um, interact with us in ways that, that they shouldn't. Uh, for instance, by you know, promoting certain medications that we might need or that we think we might need. Um, so, you know, very important not to get our information stolen, but stealing information is just one aspect. Okay, credit card numbers, again, you know, people could use our credit cards illegally. That's not the only aspect of cybersecurity. Another very important aspect is the information that we receive and the actions that we take on the internet and whether the information that we receive is correct and whether the actions that we take are the right actions. I'll give you another example uh, of this in particular. Um, a former coworker of mine was buying a house um, and he was expecting information from his bank about how to pay the down payment. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of down payment. He receives an email that looked completely legit from the right person at the bank. Now the email and the, the email address ended up not being the right one, which is what clued him in. But the picture of the bank agent was the right picture. The name was the right name. The instructions were all just as he has expected them to be. The only thing that was not right was the from address. If he had not noticed that the from address was incorrect, he might have wired hundreds of thousands of dollars to a hacker. Okay, That's not stealing information, or at least he was not his information wasn't being stolen. Somebody had stolen information from the bank in order to know that he was about to make a big payment. But from his perspective, he was receiving fake information and fake instructions, and he could have taken an action that would have been impossible to unwind, that would have cost him, you know, several hundred thousand dollars. That's why we care about cybersecurity. Um, here they make some analogies that are relevant, but partial. Uh, we have doors in our homes. And generally, we want to leave them locked when we're not at home. Or even when we are at home, we want to leave them locked. 
right? Generally, as much as possible, you want to leave your doors locked. There's no point in having your door um, unlocked so that somebody might come in who is not allowed to. So you want to keep your doors locked. Uh, not only that, but you also want people from the outside not to look inside and see what you're doing. Um, and that's not something that has to do with doors. That's something that has to do with other ways through which people could peer into your home, windows essentially. Uh, in other words, it's not just about getting access to your account and passwords, but maybe seeing your data by breaching into the database of Anthem Blue Cross. Um, and then there's the aspect of, you know, not getting somebody knocking on your door, telling you, um, you know, your house is on fire, you have to leave right away. And, and you believe them and you leave and then they go in, they steal all your stuff. So it's more than just keeping your door locked, okay? Security is complex, there's multiple aspects. I've tried to give you a sense for what they are. You should care about all of them. Um, so how do we stay safe? Hang on for a second. I need to try and keep my dog from, from barking. Give me just one second. How do I? Okay, too late now. Uh, so for one thing, we want to protect data. Okay, we want to store data in a way that it cannot be accessed by others. The most important aspect of uh, data protection is just not making the data accessible to third parties. So not leaving it out in the open. But even if you keep your data on your own hard drive to the extent that that data ever has to travel over the internet, somebody somewhere is going to have access to it. Some, somebody somewhere at some point in time is going to have access to it. Think of um, buying on a website, buying an item on a website, Amazon, Google, any, any, any website really. You have to provide your credit card information. Obviously that information is all that is necessary to execute a transaction and charge it on your credit card by construction, right? That information has to be enough. Otherwise, the legitimate website from which you legitimately want to buy something would not be able to charge your credit card. So the information you provide them has to be enough. Well, any computer on the internet along the path from your computer to the computer of the merchant is going to receive the network packets, the TCP IP packets that contain your credit card, your credit card number. So it is impossible to keep your data locked away all the time. There's always a time when you have to communicate your private data. And what you want to, what you want to ensure is that only the legitimate recipient of that communication has access to your data. One way to do this, essentially the only way to do this, is to encrypt the data. Encryption is a computing technique, an algorithm that renders the data unusable by somebody who doesn't have the key. They have a absolutely fun, beautiful dog. But it is right now disturbing for Alex and us. Delete it. Delete the dog. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Yeah, no worries. Oh, no worries. You don't delete a dog. It's not how it works. What was that? I'm sorry. No, no. <laughs> Just don't worry. Don't worry. Okay, I didn't hear that. I will uh, just move forward. Um, here's an example of how we could encrypt a message. It's a very simple example, and it's indicative of how things works, work in computers, but it's way simpler than that. It's called the Caesar cipher. How do you do that? If I want to encrypt a message, I would have to shift all the letters in the text by some number. By shift, I mean shift A by, say, two letters. If I shift A by two letters, it would become a C. If I shift B by two letters, it would become 
a D. Okay, I basically increment the letter by two letters. I, I you know shift from the letter that I want to write, the letter that my message really should contain, to a letter that's some number of of letters to its right or to its left in the in the alphabet. This is a very simple encryption. It creates a scrambled message that is meaningless when you first look at it. Uh, but a statistician can immediately decipher a, uh, a Caesar cipher encoded message. Why? Because the statistical properties of your text will look very much like the statistical properties of English language, um, except that the letters have been swapped. So, you know, imagine that in the English language, the frequency of the letter A is about, I don't know, 5% of the time. You see that one of the letters in your message appears approximately 5% of the time. It's not A, you know, it's, for instance, Q, but Q normally should have a much, much lower probability. Maybe Q happens only about 0.1% of the time in English. If you see Q appearing 5% of the time, it might mean that Q actually means A. Do you see what I mean? This is a bit tricky. Yeah, I get it. Okay. Yeah. So kind then, of. So what encryption, um, what, how should I put this? People trying to break somebody else's cipher will look at the statistical properties of the text. And if they can see that the percentages of each letter in your text roughly match the percentages of the letters in the English language, they'll say, oh, this is some kind of scrambling of the alphabet. The letter A in the clear text message, you know, the plain text message, was converted, for instance, into the letter Q. And the letter Q was converted, for instance, into the letter B, and so on. So by comparing the statistical distribution of letters in raw English and in the message, the statistician can decrypt a Caesar cipher. So we need fancier things than a Caesar cipher to encrypt our um, our passwords, or rather our um, credit cards as they um, travel through the internet. Um, let me show you something. See here, the, the little word that I selected at the top left of my screen, HTTPS. I showed you HTTP, and we've used HTTP to access the CS101 website that I created. HTTPS stands for HTTP Secure. It's an encrypted version of HTTP. I would not be able to type HTTPS on a command line. I can type HTTP, but I cannot type HTTPS on the command line because the scrambling that's done is not unlike the Caesar cipher, it's not from the English alphabet to the English alphabet, it's from binary data to binary data. I cannot type binary data on the command line, so I can't do it. It's a far more complicated way of encrypting things. And it leverages, uh, well, we'll get into it. It leverages a concept called asymmetric cryptography, where you use one password to encrypt to go from plain text to ciphertext and a different password to go from ciphertext back to plain text. So if I'm encrypting a message to you, I need to have one key. And in order to decrypt the message, you need to have the other key. Okay, that's how HTTPS works. Um, are there 100% secure ciphers, ciphers that cannot be broken no matter what. There actually are. They're called one-time pads. A one-time pad, as the name implies, is a very long list of random information, completely random data, that can be used one bit at a time to encrypt one bit of the plain text message. If Sanjay and I create a one-time pad and each one of us keeps a copy. And every time I want to send a message to Sanjay, I use 
pieces of information one bit at a time from the one-time pad. And every time he receives a message from me, he uses his one-time pad to decrypt the message and he crosses off the bits that are used every time they get used. We have a 100% secure way to communicate. There is no way to break a one-time pad code, except if the one-time pad becomes a two-time pad. In other words, you get to the end of the pad and then you say, but I have to send another message. Oh, well, I'll start from the beginning. If you reuse a one-time pad, not only are the message, the new messages no longer safe, but all the old messages can be decrypted. Okay, so there are 100% safe ways to encrypt things, but they are very impractical, very impractical. And so one-time pads are never used, okay? Because we cannot afford to send gigabytes and gigabytes and gigabytes upon gigabytes of information in a safe way that does not require encryption. Essentially, you would have to send a hard drive full of one-time pad data by Federal Express and hope that nobody catches it in flight um, to your friend. And then they would have to use that database worth of, uh, of one-time pad information and throw it away when, uh, when they're done and make sure that they destroy it safely because if anybody recovers that hard drive, then all the messages that were ever sent using it could also be recovered. So one-time pads are very safe if you use them exactly the way they are designed to be used and they're super hard to use and so nobody uses them. Um, in practice, the types of encryption that we use, well, I'll get back to that later. Um, the slides here, um, talk about another type of way of scrambling information. It's called steganography. Steganography is a set of techniques that allow you to hide a message inside another message. Whereas with cryptography, we create a message and it's clear that there is a message, but the content of the message is unreadable unless somebody has the password to it. In the case of steganography, it's unclear that there is a message at all. Okay, this is an example that our friendly uh, Stanford teacher is giving us to, sh oh gosh, yeah. to show us how you could hide text within text. Okay, that's not really something that we do with computers, but it, it provides a good example. This is a message written by a character in a novel um, that wants to fake her suicide while at the same time leaving a clue to her friends about the fact that she is alive and where she is. And so she is writing this message and every once in a while she introduces the wrong letter. By the time you read this note, my life will be at its end. And that's a grammar mistake. Its end is a grammar mistake. My heart is as cold as Ike. Well, it's not as cold as ice, it's as cold as ice. So the K is wrong. And if you notice that it's wrong, you could do something with it. And I find life unbearable, unbearable. That too should be a you. Uh, I know your children may not understand the sad life of a dowager. This is a, a spelling mistake and so on. So this message is full of mistakes. If you identify the mistakes, you can decrypt, or not decrypt, but you can identify the message left by, by you know, the character by Aunt Josephine to her, I guess, uh, nephews and nieces, Violet, Klaus, and Sonny. Okay, so how do we use steganography for real? And do we use it for real? Yes, we can use it for real, especially in the context of digital media, such as pictures or video. Let me show you an example. This is the same picture that you saw earlier, right? You recognize it. And I have another copy. You see the difference between these two copies? You see that I'm switching from one tab to another. One's a PNG and the other one's a JPEG. Right, so they are two different files. They're clearly two different files. But do you see any difference in, no. in the themselves? None whatsoever. Not right? obviously, yep. Not obviously. And yet, I have hidden a message in one of the two. And here's how. Steganography online. Great. Okay. Let's try to decode 
the JPEG message. Okay, decode. Let's see what happens. So this is supposedly the hidden message. Do you think this is the message that I hid? Nope. No. It, it is not. So what does that mean? Was there a hidden message in this image? No. There was a hidden message. But no, the algorithm doesn't know. The algorithm has to assume that there is a hidden message and has to use you know, the algorithm to extract that hidden message. Because the hidden message wasn't there, it's extracting gibberish. Now let's try to extract the message from the other one. What do you see? Yay. CS 101 is the best online class ever. So how do I do this? I went here. I chose a file. It was the original file. And I typed in a message. A quick round box over the lazy dog. Encode. And now it's showing me three different images. Okay. A, the original, a normalized image, and the image that contains the steganographic message. What is the difference? It's really hard to see. I, I mean, ideally, it should be impossible to see. The whole point is that the message has to be hidden. If we could actually see that there was a hidden message, then the, the point would not have been fulfilled, or the goal would not have been fulfilled. So what happens in the normalization stage is that the slight differences in pixel intensity that are used to encode the message have been squashed. Basically, some kind of blur filter has been applied. You remember implementing the blur filter in JavaScript? Yeah. So the normalized message has been subjected to a very, very slight blur. Imperceptible. It's so slight that it's basically imperceptible. At this resolution, our eyes just wouldn't notice. And then where the image has become slightly blurred by the blurring filter, the message is encoded by slightly increasing or slightly decreasing the light value, the intensity value of the pixel. Now, the difference is slight, but the proper filter is going to be able to recover it. Okay? So that's a way of hiding information. It's, it's a lot of fun. Um, so, you know, if I was a, um, a spy from, you know, a, an enemy country, I could post messages, I could post pictures of my hikes on my website, and it would look like a blog about hiking. And I would actually write lots of interesting comments about, you know, how I enjoyed my hike last, uh, last Sunday, and, you know, all the beautiful things that I saw. But in every picture, I could encode a little bit of a message. For somebody you know, for some evil person. It can be used for, you know, espionage and it can be used to have fun. So I did want to point this out. You have now the website here. Let me copy and paste it. Chat. If you want now to uh, have fun sending steganographic messages to your peers, your, your friends, you can do it. Now, is this how we hide information about our credit cards? No. Uh, our credit cards are stored uh, using a different kind of encryption. Um, and it's the one that I mentioned earlier. It's, the, uh, it's called, here the slide refers to it as public key encryption. 
The proper term for this technology is asymmetric key encryption. Why is it called asymmetric and why is it called public? Well, the idea behind this type of encryption is that there are two passwords. With one password, you encrypt a message. With another password, you decrypt a message. And both passwords can be used for encrypting, but whichever password you use for encrypting, you need the other password for decrypting. Okay, so there is no master password and slave password. They're both perfectly good passwords to encrypt stuff. Whichever of the two passwords you use to encrypt, you need to use the other to decrypt. Why is this important? Because if I can generate pairs of passwords that are related to one another in such a way that one can decrypt the messages created by the other and vice versa, then I can keep one secret to me and I share it with nobody. I do not put it on any public website. I do not send it over the internet. I literally keep it only on my hard drive. And I try to protect my hard drive so that nobody can steal it. That's my private key. Then I take the other key and I send it to everybody. I put it online. I put it on my, on my blog. Everybody can download it. Now I can do some really interesting things where, in, in the case where I have a secret key whose message, whose encrypted messages can be decry decrypted by a key that I have published on my blog, and vice versa, messages that are encrypted with the key that I publish on my blog can only be decrypted with my private key. What happens is that if somebody wants to send me a message, they can use the key that I've put up on my blog. If they trust that the blog is really mine, which is a big problem, but you know, if they trust that the blog is mine, they can download the key from there, encrypt a message, send me the message, and they can rest assured that only I can decrypt it because only I have the private key corresponding to the public key that's on the blog. Vice versa, if I want to send a message to Sanjay and I'm not concerned about the message being stolen. The message contains information that is not a secret. Uh, I just wanna make sure that Sanjay can be very confident that the message really came from me. Say for instance that I am the president of the United States and I want to give Sanjay an order, okay? Sanjay, you have to cook brisket because I will come and have dinner tomorrow. Okay, and it's not a secret, it's fine if everybody else knows that I'm going to have dinner at Sanjay's and eat brisket, but he needs to make sure that it's really an order coming from me because otherwise he will just ignore it. So I will encrypt the message with my private key and I will send it to Sanjay. And Sanjay will say, let me try to decrypt it with Alex's public key. If I can decrypt it with Alex's public key, it means that it came from Alex. Okay? So we can use asymmetric key, public private key systems to both receive messages securely and send messages with a guarantee of authenticity. That's important. There's another very important aspect of public key or more correctly asymmetric key encryption technology. I don't need to have a secure way of sharing keys. Let's compare and contrast this with the older approach to encryption. The older approach to encryption was that we needed to have a shared secret, a shared password. The message, every message gets encrypted with a shared password and gets decrypted with a shared password. If I need to be able to send and receive messages from Sanjay, he and I need to meet in person and share a password that we will use from here on after to encrypt messages towards one another. That's possible sometimes, but sometimes it's not possible. I, I can't always go in person and meet somebody and say, hey, let's figure out a secret password that we both share. Especially if I'm establishing a communication with somebody online that I've never talked to before. And it's not necessarily a person, it could be a server. More likely it's a server. 
I need to be able to send them information and, and have confidence that the encryption will work, even though we have not had an, an opportunity to share a password in a safe way. And so public versus private key encryption, asymmetric key encryption, satisfies that need. I have my private key, which nobody else knows, and I send the counterparty my public key. They have their private key that only they know. They can send me their public key. Now I can encrypt messages to them using both my private and their public key. They can decrypt it because they have my public and their private key. That ensures that every message really is really sent by the person whose uh, public key was used to decrypt it and can only be received by the person whose public key was used to encrypt it. Does that make sense? This is a little difficult. Do I need to explain it again? I Guys, ask, ask questions over here because this is, uh, this, is a, this is an important concept to understand. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little confused still. Okay. Hey, Susan. Part particularly in terms of Go ahead. how do they do that handshake and uh, like, how, yeah, how, how are they doing that? So that gets technical to a point where even I would have to look it up uh, on a Wikipedia article, there is a handshake stage um, in the HTTPS protocol, uh, which is called TLS. Let's look it up. Well, I, 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 yeah, the TLS, that's for the handshaking piece. Uh, the, the keys itself are uh, essentially, it, it's, it's, a, it's math, essentially. It's, it's combinatorial math that is allowing these people to have uh, their own private keys, their own public keys, and yet with their, you know, by by sharing the public key and encrypting the data with uh, whoever's sending it, right, their public key and the person who's receiving it, their private key, and then sending it back out again allows the person to decrypt the data with their own private key. So it's kind of like you're able to use, um, yeah, someone saying, I don't really get what he's talking about. Essentially, the idea is that you got people using two passwords, right, one that was given to them by somebody else, and one which is their own password to double encrypt the data, so to speak. And then when they send it back to the other person, the other person is able to decrypt the data or, or take out uh, that encryption by using their own private key. And the fun is all in the, in the details of the math. But Alex, go ahead, sorry. So I think the technicality of exactly how the TCP IP connection is set up and then on top of that, the encrypted channel is set up is beyond the point of, of this class. And I would actually have to do some you know, very detailed research to be able to uh, you know, teach a class about the protocol itself. But the general idea is this. I am sending you a message to establish a connection with you, you know, to establish a communication channel with you. And I tell you my public key. Now, you may or may not trust my identity now, trusting somebody's identity is a wholly separate problem, and it also uses encryption, but let's do, you know, take care of that later. In terms of establishing a secure communication channel, I tell you, here's my public key. I'm not telling you what my private key is. My private key, I have to keep, but I, I can tell you what my public key is. Now you have a, a way of sending me messages that only I can receive. If you encrypt your messages with my public key, only I can receive them. Now, I could ask myself the question, did I really receive a message from, uh, from Susan? Okay, so in order for me to know that I actually received a message from Susan, you would need to encrypt the message, not only with my public key, but also with your private key. If you encrypt the message twice, I can first decrypt it with your public. You encrypt it with your private key, I decrypt it with your public key. That proves to me that it was you who sent it. Then you encrypted it with my public key, I decrypt it with my private key. That doesn't prove anything to me, but it gives me access to the information that nobody else has access to because nobody else has my private key. And vice versa. 
So by encrypting every piece of information twice, once with a private key and once with a public key, we both ensure that the message originates from the right person, or not the right person, it originates from the server that we've actually connected with or the client that we connected with and that nobody else can read that information. Now, there is a related concept in public key encryption decryption, uh, which is identity verification. That's done through things called certificates. Certificates are themselves encrypted using private keys and can only be decrypted using public keys. So there are a handful of companies, small handful of companies in the world that are public certificate authorities. Everybody trusts these companies. Companies like uh, VeriSign, uh, and, and a few others. I forget who they are. They're top level certificate authorities. How do you trust the certificate authority? Well, you explicitly trust, you have to know what their public key is, and then you decide that you trust their public key, period, right? It's just a matter of trust. But you cannot know everybody in the world and trust them on a person to person basis. So you basically trust everybody that is trusted by someone you trust. Okay, so I can trust Sanjay if Sanjay is trusted by VeriSign. Now, I already trust VeriSign, so I have their public key. Now, Sanjay tells me I'm trusted by VeriSign. Here's my certificate. The certificate that he sends me is encrypted with VeriSign's private key. Because I have and I trust VeriSign's public key, I can decrypt Sanjay's certificate. But once I decrypt Sanjay's certificate, I know that that certificate was issued by VeriSign because otherwise I wouldn't have been able to decrypt it. And so if Sanjay has a legitimate certificate from VeriSign, he is trusted by VeriSign. I trust VeriSign, now I can trust Sanjay. That's a core component in HTTPS. It is possible to create a website that has only encryption and no trust, but it wouldn't be terribly useful because I would basically only guarantee that nobody along the path from here to the merchant is getting access to my credit card information. But if the merchant isn't the, person, isn't the company that they claim they are, I would still potentially be sending my credit card information to the bad guys. Right? So encryption is important to prevent third parties from accessing information, but it's also important to make sure that we're sending the information to the right people. So this is a certificate. This is a Stanford's certificate, okay? And it's issued by somebody. It's issued by in common RSA server CA. I have no idea who they are, um, but you know, this is the certificate that in what was the name of the company in something um, in common created the certificate for Stanford and encrypted it. Let's see if we can find who encrypted the certificate for in common. It's called a certificate chain. Stamp extension. Oh, here it is. This is in commons. Uh, certificate. Now, I don't directly trust in common. However, in common's certificate was signed by, where do we find that? I guess it was signed by user trust. There you go. Certificate authority information access user trust. Who is user trust? User trust is a company that specializes in issuing top level certificates. They issue certificates to certification authorities. And I only trust user trust, not because they themselves are trusted by somebody else. I trust them because I trust them. Now, who, de who decides whether I trust user trust or not? It's really Google that decides that. Why? Because I'm using a Google browser and the Google Chrome browser comes with a pre-installed trusted certificate from user trust. So if I download Chrome, when I load the Chrome browser, it already trusts 
user trust. And then as a consequence, it will trust any website that is trusted by user trust, and it will trust any website that is trusted by a website that is trusted by user trust. Alex, do you know the answer to this question? Drew was asking, who is the top dog of certificate assigning? There is no single top dog. There's a yeah. handful of top dogs, user trust being one. Uh, who determines who the top dogs are? Largely Google and Microsoft, basically the authors of browsers. OK, if Google decides tomorrow that they don't like the CEO at user trust because he doesn't shave well, they decide to revoke the user trust certificate from all Chromes with the next update. And user trust is no longer trusted. And that's tr that has a huge impact because if user trust is not trusted, then in common is not trusted. If in common is not trusted, then Stanford is not trusted. And when we connect to a, an untrusted website, what happens? Chrome shows us a window saying, somebody is trying to impersonate the website that you want to connect to. It's not safe. You should not go there. And then there's a way to bypass that protection. But a priori, uh, Chrome and other browsers will just prevent you from accessing an untrusted website. So it's a very important relationship, the one between the top dogs of certification and the authors of the browsers. Now, can I add a top dog certification authority if I want? Yes. Chrome allows me to add one of these top level certificates if I really want. And I could create my own certification authority, which I typically do for business purposes. I, you know, I create my own mini certification authority for my own company. And it's only me. And so because nobody really trusts me other than me, if I want to use my certification authority, I have to load it. I have to load my own certificate into my browser. But that, that's OK, because I trust myself. You know, I, I think I'm good enough to trust myself. OK. Now, how convoluted was that about public key encryption and private keys and doubly encrypting things with a public and a private key? That helped me a lot. I understand now. OK, and otherwise, rest of the guys, but I understand. OK, and otherwise, this concept of public keys and private keys sounds really magical and, you know, it, it's it is not, magical. I mean, it, it, yeah, it looks magical. It, it's incredibly powerful. Um, and uh, and it's, it's not entirely easy to figure out. Uh, but I think, you know, the idea that you have these two passwords, one to encrypt and one to decrypt, or rather, both can be used to encrypt, but then whichever one you use to encrypt, the other one has to be used to decrypt, is really the key intuition. Now, there's another aspect of uh, asymmetric key encryption that I want to point out. The two passwords are a function of one another. Do you know what function means in math? For instance, uh, the logarithm. You know, what is the logarithm in base 2 of 8? The logarithm in base 2 of 8 is 3. You know, it's a function. If I tell you the logarithm of an unknown number is 8, you can tell me, well, that unknown number is not that unknown. We can pretty much be sure that it's 8 because its log is three. And if I know that the log is three, I know that the number whose log is three has to be eight, right? Or yep. sim simpler example, you know, cubed. Okay, the function y is equal to x cubed. If I tell you, um, again, eight, right? If I tell you some, some number cubed is eight, you can tell me, well, I'm pretty sure that the number that you cubed was two. Those two numbers are a function of one another. If you know one, there is a procedure to find the other. If I tell you the number that I'm raising to the cube power is two, you can tell me, well, then the cube power is going to be eight. If I tell you the cube power is eight, you can tell me the number that you are cubing is two. The two numbers are a function of one another. Okay, Those types of functions are called invertible functions or one-to-one -one functions. 
passwords in um, asymmetric uh, cryptography, asymmetric encryption, have to be in a one-to-one -one functional relationship with one another. Why? Because there can only be one public key to decrypt a message encrypted with a private key, and there can only be one private key to decrypt a message encrypted with a public key. So they have to be in a one-to-one -one relationship. And that relationship has to be known. Because if it were unknown, then nobody could implement the software to use public key encryption. So we are in a situation where I'm giving you my public key and you know how public keys and private keys relate to one another. So what's going to stop you from generating the private key that corresponds to the public key? That's a bit of a problem, right? I'm basically giving you all the information you need. If I give you the public key, I'm giving you, strictly speaking, all the information you need to decrypt, not to decrypt, but to translate the public key into the private key. And once I, you've translated the, the public key into the private key, you can decrypt any message that, that's only for me. So how is that safe? Right? That doesn't seem safe to me. Um, don't they actually like have firewalls or like they have to like confirm someone to join? Not in this case. Bear in mind, a public key is public, right? It's something that I'm putting out on my website. Everybody uh, should be able to know my public key. Yeah, but if you if you're trying to get the private key, then if you're gonna use the if you're gonna try to use the private key, then um, don't they like have to allow you to like use it or something? Well, nobody should have somebody else's private key. You should never allow anybody to have your private key, period. That's the whole point. It's private. It should not be given out to anybody ever for no reason. However, the public key we give out freely. And the point I'm making is, let's say that the algorithm to go from public key to private key was that the public key is the cube of the private key. And I'm telling you, hey, I'm not going to tell you what my public key or what my private key is, but I'm telling you my public key is eight. Can you guess what my private key is? Yes, you should be able to guess it. It's going to be two because two is eight. Okay, so it's possible. It is, strictly speaking, possible to translate a private key into a public key and vice versa, a public key into a private key. Why is that not a problem? Because though that translation is possible, it takes an unbelievably long time to perform that calculation on a computer. And that's why we need long keys. You know, once upon a time we had 1,024 bit keys. Now we're using 2,048 bit keys. And then sometime in the future we'll switch to, you know, 4,000 bit keys and so on. Why do we need bigger and bigger keys? Because the longer the key, the longer it takes to translate from public to private. And the point is, this has to be hard. It has to be possible. It has to be possible. I mean, can, we, can we walk through two examples? Let's say you're trying to send some some data that you don't want to share with anybody. You're trying to send one copy to me, right? And then you're trying to send some other data to, I don't know, somebody else. Let's say we're trying to send it to Druva, right? So you have a public key, you have a private key. I have a public key, I have a private key. Druva has a public key and he has a private key, right? So let's say you have a message that needs to be sent to me. So how would that actually work? What do you need from me to send me the message? What do I need from you to understand the message? Let's so start with that. All of us have published our public keys. For instance, we've put them on a, on a website or, or we're just sending them via email. Somehow or other, everybody should have everybody else's public key. That's easy, right? It's just not a private yeah. piece of information, so it's easy to it's like, it's like It's almost like a street address, street, street address. Like everybody may know it or whatever. It's fine. It's everybody cool. should know. Now, we all have our own private key. Nobody else has each other's private key. So if I want to send a message to Sanjay, 
I will encrypt the message to Sanjay using Sanjay's public key, which I have, and using uh, so Sanjay's public key, which I have, and my private key. Yep. Sanjay will decrypt the message using his private key and using my public key. Decrypt Does that make sense? That's super important to understand. Yeah. OK. For the most part. Let me show you an example of how we can actually generate um, a um, public private key pair. So one type of public private key that people use all the time are called SSH keys. Mostly it's engineers that use them, but there's also users that might be using software that relies on SSH. So let's generate an SSH key. OK. It's generating a public-private RSA key pair. OK, it's generating both keys at the same time. Generating both public and private at the same time does not take a very long time. And now let me store this in SSH CS101, CS101, OK? That'll be the name of this key. Return. Enter the passphrase. I can further. Oh, they can't. They can't see your screen if you're doing something with it. Oh gosh. Uh, okay. Then we'll start from scratch. Yes, because I'm always sharing one window. Thanks for letting me know. Oh, they they, they, they okay. let us know in the chat. Your entire screen. Okay. Now you should be able to see my terminal. Okay. Yeah. So the command is SSH keygen. It tells me it's generating a public-private RSA key pair. Great. Let me give it a name. This will be the CS101 example. Turn. So I want to further encrypt my private key with my private password, which is entirely secret. It's only for me. I will encrypt this key with my own secret. So I'll call my password. It will be secret. Type it again. There you go. And all of a sudden, I've got two files, a public key and a private key. Let me show you the private key. This gibberish is my private key. Now. I should, under no circumstance, show my private key to anybody. I'm only doing this because I will never actually use this key. Yeah, Understood? he just generated it for fun so that you guys can see what an example of this looks like. Yeah? yeah, I will throw it away. I will throw it away. So I will never use this. And I would never show a real key to somebody, to anybody, period. The corresponding public key is called dot .pub. And instead of being a square, it's a long list of gibberish. OK, but it's the same kind of thing. It's gibberish. OK, so both the public key and the private key are gibberish. The public key is not encrypted gibberish. I need to be able to send it to you guys. Everybody needs to be able to have my public key. So it's not encrypted. You don't need a password to use my public key. But I need a password to use my private key. So let's see, for, for example, how I might use my public key. Let me go trust my uh, new key so that I can use my new key to connect to my own computer. Let's see if this works. I never actually tried it on a Mac. Okay, so I added my prime, my new public key to my authorized keys. And now I will use my uh, private key to connect to my computer. Let's see if that works. Local host. It doesn't work because I have SSH disabled on my computer. Because it's That's easy. okay. That's okay. So let me untrust my key before I forget.
So that's how you create a pair of keys. So as you can see, creating a pair that contains you know, both public and private took a second. It is possible to recreate the public key given only the private key, and it's possible to recreate only the private key given the public key. However, it wouldn't take a second. It would take millions of years on my computer. And it would take probably you know, a year if you threw all of Google's servers at the problem. So a very large organization could still crack this key, OK? Given a lot of money, a lot of resources, they could still crack this key. There are, you know, you can make, I, go ahead. I have a, I have a quick question. Please. So why would they need uh, money or resources to um, try to crack the code? Basically, the only way to convert a public key to a private key is to generate random keys and see which one matches. And, so, and there are, you know, oh. trillions of quadrillions of quintillions of possibilities. So if you have a lot of computers, say that you can check one random combination. Say you can check a million random combinations per second per computer. Okay, if you have one million computers at the problem, you can check 1,000 billion, so 1 trillion combinations per second. Okay, in the course of a year, you can check 1 quintillion different combinations of public, uh, pub, public key, private key pair. At some point, you will have enough computers working at the problem for enough time to be able to find the corresponding key. Oh, so okay. What you can do is make it impractical. I can make it so complicated that it would take you too much time and too many computers for you to really want to do it. But it's not impossible. It cannot be impossible. If it were impossible to get the private key from the public key, the whole thing would not work. So it has to be possible to translate from private to public and from public to private. However, it also has to be very hard. Now, all of our cryptography is based on the RSA mechanism that I just showed you using SSH. There is one bug in that mechanism, which everybody's a little scared of now. The problem is that the RSA asymmetric key encryption is not robust to quantum computing. Google recently announced that they have a quantum computer. Not only Google, there's a couple other companies that are saying we've got quantum computers that work just fine. If you make a big enough quantum computer, you can decrypt, not decrypt, you can translate from my public key to my private key in the matter of minutes. What would have taken you know, millions of years on you know, a large number of ordinary computers will take minutes on a single quantum computer. That's a problem. That's a problem. It's a problem that everybody knows about, and so steps are being taken to address that problem. There are new and improved public key encryption techniques that are robust to quantum computing. They have not been rolled out because quantum computers are not there yet to the point where that needs to be done today. But we will need to switch from RSA to something new that is robust to quantum computing. Okay? We take so, a break? We could take a break. Take a quick uh, break. I have progressed rather slowly. I'm wondering whether we should uh, extend maybe the class by a day and give it a little bit more time on the security side. I think it's an important topic, and I delved into a whole lot more detail than um, the CS101 slides really supposed. What do you guys think? I think that I think that's a good idea. As long as we are uh, able to revise, so if we pick up with this next Monday, then we'll have to just do a quick revision of some of the things that you did today because there are some of the concepts carry over. So what do we do? Let's take a five-minute break. Let's go till seven fifteen. Let's stop. Come back on Monday and pick up wherever we stop. Sound good? Okay. Okay. So come back in five minutes. Thank you, guys.
folks on Jay, are you still there? Yeah, I'm just responding to some messages on the chat because there was a confusing, I got confused by a question, so I'm just responding to people now. Okay. So. Sneha, yeah. we have no more. Um...
Doggo. All right, we're learning a new kind of encryption called canine encryption. That's why the dog. Yeah. All right, let's do it. He is joining us for the remainder of the CS101 class. Woohoo! So small. Oh, he's so cute. She is a sausage dog. Short. He's so cute. I expected so it to be a big dog. He was barking so loud. That's the worst yeah. kind of dog. The worst. <laughs> <laughs> the worst kind of dog. That's right. That's mean. <laughs> it's his dog. You're being mean to his dog. Oh, you did not understand my German. Yeah. You need to understand my German. Okay. So now she stole her fake bone and left. Okay. Excellent. Let's go. Okay. So I will leave the misconception versus reality slides for the next time because I think they are somewhat unrelated to the encryption uh, topic. This is actually very related to what, we're, uh, what we just discussed. So we talked about, you know, uh, the need to stay safe, to, you know, have, um, you know, prevent hackers from getting access to your secret information, prevent, ac prevent hackers from getting access to your accounts. Well, the way we prevent people from getting access to our accounts is by using passwords, okay? Now, passwords are a secret. And the whole point is that they have to be a shared secret because I need to be able to authenticate myself with Google, with Gmail, by telling Google, here's my password. And Google needs to be able to check my password and see, oh yeah, this is the right one. So it's a shared secret. It's a very important secret. If somebody gets access to that secret, especially on a company like Google that runs a plethora of different services that I, that I sh store my data in, if they steal that piece of information, they can get access to a lot of stuff. Okay, so first point, in order to prevent hackers from having unfettered access to all of your online data, you should never reuse the same password with more than one counterparty. My Google password is only for Google. My Facebook password is only for Facebook. My LinkedIn password is only for LinkedIn. Let me show you how I generate a password so that I know that you know, my passwords are uh, unique. I have a tool called PassX. There's a bunch of tools like this online. Some of them are free, some of them. You're not, it, Alex, you're not sharing your screen. Oh gosh, thank you. Uh, would, it, would it be okay for your passwords if you use different variations of a password? In general, no. In general, no. The more, um, the, the less variation there is between passwords, the easier it is to recover them. Okay, so let me show you the proper way to deal with passwords. I got a tool called KeyPassX. And there's plenty of these tools out there. They're called password managers. Some of them are free, some of them are paid. And some of the paid ones are really bad and some of the free ones are really good. So I think KeyPassX does a decent job and, and it's free, it's convenient. So say that I want to sign up for uh, a great new website that I found and I want to create an account and I want to give them my credit card and all that stuff. Okay, so I'll go here and I'll click on this button which allows me to create a new password. Title, so this will be the title of my password. You know, and I want to sign up for a wonderful new website that just appeared on the internet last week. It's called A Brave New Website. So the title will be A Brave New Website. My username is Alex and my password, well, I don't want to type a password. I want to generate a password. My standard passwords are 32 characters long. And look at them. They're relatively easy to type. They don't have weird characters. They don't have Cyrillic and Aramaic characters. You know, they're all characters that you can easily find on a regular keyboard, which helps, um, but they're long. And sometimes if I get really peculiar about my password, I can make it even longer, I can make it even longer, right? I have absolutely no problem generating a very, very long password because I don't have to remember it. I don't even have to type it. I just copy and paste. 
Generally, 32 is considered pretty good. So I'll take this password, I will accept it, and now the password is stored. Okay, and then I click OK and it gets saved. Now I don't want to click OK and save it because I'm not really interested in having that thing. Um, but that's how I would create a password. And I would take this very long password and copy and paste it into a Brave New website's new user form. And, and now I would have a very safe password. Why do I want to use a password manager? Because if, like I do, uh, I have hundreds upon hundreds of passwords that I need to remember. See how many passwords I have here. You know, lots of passwords, very, very many. I don't want to have to remember them all. There is no way I can remember them all. I don't even remember what passwords I have, let alone what they are. So I need to use a password manager, okay? Mm -hmm. So let's assume that I have used the password manager, and so I have a very, very difficult password that cannot be guessed. If it cannot be guessed, there's only one way to get it, and that's to hack into Google. Let's assume this is Google's password. The only way to get it is to hack into Google. Is that possible? Yes. It is possible, right? Google is probably a well-protected company, but it's certainly possible. And there are companies that are way less well protected than Google. Think Anthem Blue Cross, think uh, Equifax, think Paychex. So now what happens if a hacker hacks into the Equifax database and downloads the list of passwords that are stored in the database? Now they would have completely unfettered access to every account that, that it was ever created on Equifax. That would be bad. That would be really, really bad. Does that happen? Yes, it does. There are really bad companies out there that don't know what they're doing from a security perspective that will allow this to happen. But are there ways to protect against the hacker downloading the entire list of data of uh, the entire list of passwords that a company has? There are ways. The most important one is called hashing. Hashing is related to encryption, but it's not the same thing. It's related to encryption in that uh, it is a technique to transform data that is recognizable for instance, my password, into data that is not recognizable. However, whereas in the case of encryption, there is a way to transform the unrecognizable data back into what it was originally, with hashing, this is impossible. And so you can only transform readable data into unreadable data with hashing. OK? Now, why would you want to do that? Well, you can do that because you want to be able to check whether the information that somebody is providing to you is right. But you don't want to store what the information should be. You only want to store an unrecognizable form of that information. Remember my password, my very long, well, I, I download, I deleted it now. But you remember seeing a minute ago my very long 32 character password. A website should not store my password. If they store my password and somebody steals the database, then they would have my password. They could use it to log in, no problem. What the website should do is they should store a hash of my password, which is an unreadable, unrecognizable string of data that can only be generated by having the password to begin with. Now, if they store the hash, when I log in, they can compute the hash. And if the hash that they computed from the password that I typed matches the hash that they stored in their database, they let me in. Because that proves that I had the right password. They don't know what the right password is, but they can check whether I have it. That's the idea. All the websites that are doing a good job from a security perspective, are not storing your password. They are storing a hash of your password. 
And when you sign in, they check the hash. They compute the hash of the password that you just typed, and they compare the computed hash with the stored hash. Now, in order for this thing to be secure, they need to have a secret key that they use as part of the hashing process. Much like when I encrypt a message to Sanjay, I have to use a key, a private key, a public key, some kind of key. When I hash a password or when I hash any piece of information, I need to use a secret key. The advantage, which makes it a little bit easier here, is that I don't need that secret key to be shared with anybody. It's just mine, and I don't need anybody else to have it. There's no public, no private. It's just one key, and I just need to keep it safe. And if I keep that key safe, nobody can generate the hashes on my behalf. I'm the only one who can generate the hashes. And, and the hashed messages can never be decrypted. It's just impossible to decrypt them. So that's important. So securely hashing passwords is extremely important as a security measure on the internet. Does, does that make any sense? Yes. OK. And then there's another point that I'd like to make in the next few minutes. And we talked about passwords and using a password manager. There's a very interesting um, XKCD comic about passwords. You guys know about XKCD? It's a very geeky uh, no. comic website. It's, it's very fun if you guys are into science and math and computer science. XKCD.com. Free. It has a few thousand of these, um, of these cartoons. And uh, you know the guy who publishes this website creates one, a new cartoon every few days. So he has thousands of them. He has been doing this for years. He used to be a computer scientist, or rather, he used to be a programmer by a you know, day job. Not anymore. Now he is uh, an author. He publishes books, and, and he does this, uh, this website, and it's great. So years ago, he published this, um, this image. And he is showing a common way of generating a complicated password. And he's showing you how hard it is to remember. And then he is showing a simple way of generating a very long password, which is easy to remember. This is still not good enough. I mean, it's, it's fun, it's interesting, but it's not good enough. Why? Because there's no way that I can remember thousands of passwords for thousands of places for which I have a password. So the only really good way to store passwords is this. Okay, read the comic, the, the, you know, the cartoon, it's fun, but really the only safe way to generate and, and manage passwords is using something like KeePassX, okay? Um, what else did I wanna say before we switch to the next thing? So we talked about hashing of passwords. Yeah, multi-factor multi authentication is, um, I guess, the last topic for tonight. Passwords can be stolen. No matter how hard you make it to steal them, they can be stolen. And hashing, you know, does not resolve all the problems, and, and password managers don't resolve all the problems. And so we need a way to further increase the security of our computing resources. The way we do this is by combining multiple ways of proving who we are. Having a password proves who we are through knowledge. I am who I am because I know a secret that only I should know. Okay. Now, this means of authentication can be um, sidestepped by stealing my secret information. So, if I combine this secret knowledge with some other means to prove who I am that makes it harder for somebody to gain access to my identity. One way is to prove that I have something that I am supposed to have. For instance, a UB key. I actually have. Um, don't have it here with me, 
but you can see a lot of pictures of it on the internet. These are very small pieces of hardware that contain a secret. And every YubiKey is different from another. So I have a YubiKey, you guys could go buy your own YubiKey, uh, but it's your YubiKey is not gonna allow you to access to my YubiKey protected account and vice versa. Okay, they're unique. Every single one is different. If I use one of these keys to protect an account, you know, you really need to have the key. Now, that's good from a security perspective. It enhances my security. The problem is, right now, I don't have my YubiKey on me. It's probably somewhere around my home. But mine, I'll show you. What's that? I got mine. I can show well, you. I mean, good for you. And I'm like, see, see this. I had mine on my keyboard or on my desk, but it's not on my desk. So it's somewhere here at home. But if I wanted to log into Amazon right now, I couldn't because I don't have my key. So that's a problem. Another approach is to use biometric information. So we have knowledge, something you know, possession, something you have, and biometrics, something about you, something you are, okay? A fingerprint, retina scan, I haven't really seen. The, the really common ones are fingerprint and face recognition. Face recognition, you're, if you guys have an iPhone, you know about the, the three-dimensional face model that the Apple thingamabob does to recognize your face. And you know if your brother or your sister or your cousin or your dad or your mom looks like you, they'll be able to use your iPhone. So biometric is important, but only in combination with something else. Biometric by itself is actually not safe. So you know I wouldn't trust uh, an iPhone with my with my face, you know, with uh, authenticating me based on my face only, or any other device that does that. So the combination of these things, of some number of these things, at least two, keeps us relatively safe. One mechanism that I like, which is based on the possession idea, is receiving a text message. When I log on to certain websites, they will send me a text message with a small code that is only good for a couple of minutes, I need to type in that code. And that means that I have my website, I have my cell phone with me. <clears throat> and I do have my cell phone with me. I actually do have my cell phone with me. Okay, so this is all about passwords. Um, how we store them on the server, which is through hashing, how we generate them and store them on our side, which is through a password manager, and what else do we do to keep ourselves safe? And that's multi-factor authentication. How many of these things that I'm recommending should you be doing? All of them. All of them. You really have to be doing all of them. For every website you, you have, you should be doing all of these things. You should enable multi-factor authentication on every website. You should use well, hashing you cannot control. You can only hope that the company is doing this, but you should be using a password manager for all your passwords. There is one password that I remember, which I've never written down anywhere. It's nowhere to be found. That's my password manager's password. Make sense? And this advice is really bad advice. Your master password is stored in Dropbox or Google Drive. <laughs> that is you know, oh yeah that's a terrible idea terrible idea <laughs> like, no your master password is not written or stored anywhere that's the one password you have to remember and it has to be a complicated one so that's where you use the xkcd advice and you come up with you know a whole sentence in some you know strange language that only you know and that makes it easy for you to remember it, and it makes it impossible for everybody else. Okay. I think I'm good for today. So next uh, next time we'll talk about the misconceptions in security, and we'll talk about attacks and ways to compromise the security of a computer system. Okay. Okay. And. Yeah. Thank you guys.
So just to be clear, we, we are not meeting for the rest of this week. Okay, so Alex and I have some stuff to do because we've got Easter coming up and whatnot. So the next class will be next Monday where Alex will pick up on this. And then we will finish out with two more classes. And you know, maybe if you guys are interested, we can do a final review. Sound good? All right, so enjoy the rest of the week off. Uh, you guys want to do some some reading on any of these topics, refer to the slide deck in the doc, and uh, we will see you guys next Monday. Alex, you want to stop recording now? Yeah.